covering. My name's Stephen Benu. You're watching Israeli News Live. It is all firing up again. Uh, we told you guys on April the 3rd, uh, just a couple of days before the U.S. government struck Syria with Tomahawk cruise missiles, 59 cruise missiles in all. As we reported this, even before the sarin gas attack that was blamed on Bashar al-Assad that no doubt was done by the rebels only to get uh, justification for this airstrike to get started. And that was to help knock out some of Assad's warplanes there to uh, prepare for a ground invasion, something we've been saying that's going to happen. Uh, we've shared that information. Some of the information we have uh, really are indebted to our good friend Lorenzo had already happened. His diligent efforts there to un, uh, unlock the movement of the U.S. Uh, military equipment being moved into Beirut, Beirut, Lebanon, as well as into uh, uh, Jordan's uh, Aquaba port off the Gulf of Aquaba, right down near Elat, Israel. Uh, before we get into all this here, let me just remind you guys, we do need your support and help in making our broadcast possible. And we did try to make it a bit easier for you. For those of you that are having trouble donating on, on IsraeliNewsLive.org, our website page, you can also right here on our YouTube channel above the subscribe button here, we were able to put a little link right here. We do thank you for your kindness in making this all possible. Let's get right back into this. Very serious news as we stated, they were putting US military equipment there. Uh, and, and again, gotta really thank Lorenzo here for doing that on Already Happened. This is his Twitter page here. Don't forget, he was the one that shared with us uh, and he's so kind to send a lot of this to us so we know in advance what's going on, uh, but was showing how that the equipment was being moved, loaded up there in Romania. Uh, think, we have to thank uh, President Barack Hussein Obama for being the guy that sent all this over to Europe with the intentions of taking down Syria. Believe me, it was started long ago. Here was one of those uh, uh, insights there that Lorenzo shared with us here. That was one of the ships from Romania went down through Suez there, dropped down there around the Sinai Peninsula and beelined it right there to the Gulf of Aqaba, right into to Jordan itself. I believe if that equipment hasn't already been unloaded, it's the backup equipment for what the United States is planning on doing. Uh, but before that, uh, we also had the information there of the troop movement uh, that was going into Beirut, Lebanon. That again, Lorenzo had, had put this together uh, did an outstanding job, and that was this right here. I expected both the Roro ships moored at Port of Beirut, Lebanon this morning. They were already there, but on the April the 2nd, uh, Lorenzo had already picked up that information showing it going in. Then what do we find out today? Blast off in the Russian language, translated for you here in the English language, newsru.co.il, a Russian news source. This has only been released tonight, friends. Media, Jordan, US, and the UK begin operation on Syrian border, as the El Hayat newspaper published in London City's political sources in Jordan. The U.S., British, and Jordanian military forces will launch a joint operation against, as they call it, terrorists on the Jordanian-Syrian border. The most dangerous of the groups operating here is the Khalid bin al-Walid army, the local branch of the Islamic State. Its, uh, its main bases are located in the area where the borders of Jordan and Syria and Iraq meet. Only 70 kilometers uh, from here are the positions of the Iranian Corps of Guards and the Islamic Revolution. The public notes that their presence in the border area raises fears not only for Jordan, but also Israel. That, friends, is not uh, a good plan to begin with. That is letting us know that what is happening right now is that the U.S. is getting more troops now to the south side. Uh, now, of course, that's further to the east there. Let me just quickly throw you a map up here so we can make sure we got what we're looking at here so we can see exactly uh, what this is, what we're speaking of here when we're looking at uh, uh, this region of the world. Let me jump out of Europe here where we are right now, get over here into Syria as he states there. It's right there by the Iraqi and Syrian Jordan board in there, the far eastern por portion here, right there. Now notice though, what will that allow them to do? An 
east, a, 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 from, from coming in from the east to be able to strike Damascus from the east. Now, I already told you, I believe that they're going to also stage in here from the south. Israel already has their own uh, uh, war games going on over here in the Golan. Uh, and I think that Israel's there to protect themselves from what the U.S., U.K., uh, and others are going to be doing here to Damascus. They may get involved in it. I hate to say it, but they may get involved in it as well. But remember, we told you Lebanon, because why? Our good friend Lorenzo showed that ship the U.S. ship full of military equipment docking right there in Beirut, Lebanon. Well, guess what we also discovered today? Uh, we found this article here. Kind of interesting, right? U.S. General discusses military aid on Lebanon visit. Well, what do you know? We had the United States General discussing military aid to Lebanon on February 28, 2017 only two months ago. Isn't that an odd coincidence? Beirut, the commander of U.S. forces in the Middle East, has met with top officials in Lebanon to discuss American military aid and other efforts to contain the fallout from the civil war in neighboring Syria. You think those Tomahawk, 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles that fell over there on Syria was because uh, Bashar al-Assad really gassed the people there? I don't think so. We've already shown you all the evidence. Clearly, this man had nothing to do with gassing those people. They did that. They threw that in there. You know, they already got the sarin gas that Seymour Hirsch brought out from, uh, from the, from the uh, Libya uh, war, taking the chemical weapons there. They can kind of slip those in there through uh, some nice channels that they got working in there with the... Uh, uh, Free Syrian army there, and what do you know? Next thing you know, blame it on Assad that they did that. Oh, we got to bomb Assad for doing that bad boy, knock out your air force and everything. Well, you know, 59 cruise missiles went in, but only 23 reached their destination. What in the world happened to the other 26? Now, I will say this. I think that Russia or Syria 1 used the S-300 S-400 system to knock them out, but the S-300 and S-400 system is not very successful in doing it. As Russian news, as we shared with you earlier uh, yesterday, that the Russian sources were showing the curvature of the Earth, the low altitude of the Tomahawks, they had found a way to avoid being struck by those systems there. And I don't think that Russia wanted to admit to it, neither Syria, that they were trying to knock out those targets there because they weren't successful on all of them. Only about 50%, which is a very low profile for Russia as well, and that would be a major shame. But it's also a major shame that the Tomahawks didn't all reach their target. Therefore, they did not wipe out this airfield that they were targeting. But remember, Miss Haley there, the uh, uh, spokesman for the United Nations, of, uh, for the United States, the ambassador of the United Nations, Miss Haley said that that was only the beginning of what they're planning on doing. They're planning on doing more. Well, yes, they are. As we just showed you, already over here in Jordan there with the U.S. and the U.K. and the Jordanians getting ready to do an invasion on the southern border there uh, with a beeline to the eastern side of Damascus. Hmm, that's pretty doggone interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. And what do you know? All that equipment that shows up in Beirut just seems to be mysterious. Well, the generals were meeting over there with the Lebanese. We're getting ready to attack Syria and take it down. Can we have your uh, bases there for a little support on this? I don't think Hezbollah will be so appreciative of that, will they? Well, not that I really care for Hezbollah either, because they are definitely a, star, uh, a, a, a major enemy of Israel. Okay, let's move on to other news. Let's take, not so much other news, still on the same subject, subject here. Prime Minister Medvedev said this, that the America's serious strike is on the verge of a military uh, clash. He actually wrote that on his Facebook page of all places, uh, but he did say that they're on the verge of a military clash. I did note, though, and this is what's very interesting, it's going to take a pretty heavy-duty situation to get Russia involved in protecting President Bashar al-Assad. Too many Russian experts are saying that Russia has no agreement with Syria to protect them from such an invasion of the United States or Britain or any of the NATO allies. But we have seen Russia retaliate before 
And it's always because Russian troops are involved in the death toll. Remember De La Zord? De La Zord, they killed uh, upwards to 89 uh, soldiers. Now, 60 is what you normally see reported, 60, 69. That was because it was all the Syrian army soldiers. But we normally don't get to see about the other 20, which were Russian special forces that were killed in that attack in De La Zord, where the NATO allies bombed for one hour straight. And even though they were being told by Russia, you are not hitting ISIS, you are hitting Jordanian and Russian soldiers. Never made Western media didn't even make too much in Russian media until we caught it ourselves in the back pages of Russian media there. The Russian soldiers died as well. Well, you know, the Russians ended up using a uh, tactical nuclear weapon inside of Aleppo where there was a, a hangar in there, not a hangar, hangar, but an underground bunker that just so happened to be housing Saudi, Qatar's, Turkish, U.S., and Israeli special op forces. Not so much special forces, but the, you know, the Mossad, CIA, that were directing these targets. And Russia used a tactical nuke, bunker busters, as they call it, and wiped them out. This is when you saw all the excitement at the United Nations for a ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire. And even when the U.S. and Syrian army cornered and captured, uh, or at least cornered, they didn't take them prisoner, 250 U.S. Army troops working with the pre-Syrian army inside of Syria, as well as, I think it's 45, 50 British special forces as well. It's been some major embarrassments. Never made Western media, but we did catch it here on Israeli News Live and share that information with you. Anyway, so there is a war beginning to brew. Tensions are rising. Russia and Iran have warned U.S. they will respond with force if red line crossed in Syria again. Well, Russia, Iran, you might as well just get ready because they're definitely going to cross it and they're not worried about you getting in the way. And in fact, what they're doing over here, I believe, as they note in here, that Iranian forces are just 70 kilometers on the other side of that position there. Looks like they're getting ready to take out those Iranian forces. That's going to be one of the first targets that they're going to go for. And you can doggone well believe that's going to be their main target there. So all the red lines that they want to speak about, they're definitely going to cross it, and I'm afraid that this could escalate to a nuclear war. Russia may not protect uh, Bashar al-Assad uh, in this case here, but he is going to protect his own. That doesn't include the Iranians, but then they, the three of these countries will end up having to fight together. But unfortunately, biblically, they're not going to stand. And you have to remember, friends, you know, some people might say, well, you know, Steve, you seem to side with Assad too much. Well, no, I don't side with Assad. I side with what's right and what's wrong. And I don't believe that the man being falsely accused of an attack in the country is the right thing to do. Okay? I realize at this point now, I would like to see Assad step down as well. But I also realize if Assad steps down, do you realize the massacre of his military that will happen as a result by all these different 35 different nationalities that are in his country right now. Do you imagine what will happen to the Christian population there? Do you remember, my friends that are Christians, do you remember that it was Damascus where some of the first churches that were ever developed was in Damascus? Remember Paul, he was on his road to Damascus to deal with those believers that were there, the early believers of Yeshua, the Gentile first, some of the first Gentile believers were in Damascus. Do we forget the fact that Syrians are the cousins of the Jewish people? It's another reason why I do care about the Syrian people as well. Because why? Jacob, our father, who is named Israel, married the beautiful Rebecca. Remember that? Hmm. I'm sorry, Rachel and Leah. I'm getting mixed up with Isaac, my apology. He married the beautiful Leah and Rachel, Rachel being the beautiful one, Leah Naz being, being the more the humble one there. But if you remember that, he went to Syria. They were Syrian girls. So we have a connection between is the, the Jewish people of today and the Syrian people. We do have, we are related, distant, distant cousins, no doubt. But you know, we, we need to think about it in, in those type of terms as well. But as I stated, biblically, it's going to happen anyway. Russia Defense Ministry to suspend communications on the hotline with the Pentagon as of April the 8th. This was on April the 7th. I wanted to bring this up again. 
this right here is uh, Igor uh, Kanashkinov. He is a commander for the Israeli Armed Forces there. What this means by this uh, discontinuing the, this disagreement that they've had over there is the fact that Russian pilots have now been told, and I've read this in the Russian news already, that they are to conduct themselves as being in an act of war and that they do not need permission to engage any NATO or U.S. plane. That's the way they stated it, NATO or U.S. plane. That if they feel threatened, they do not need orders to shoot down the plane. That's pretty serious. Let's real quick, friends, take a look at this from a biblical perspective. Um, uh, oh, let me, uh, we'll, we'll go into this in just a moment here. Come back, I'll come back to uh, Lorenzo's website already happened in just a moment here. Zephaniah, as well as Amos. Amos, I think, is very important. I, I meant to bring this out yesterday and I forgot to bring it out. But if you go to Amos chapter 1, verse 5, and I will break the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from uh, Be Bekath Avon and him that holdeth the scepter from Beth Eden. Okay, and the people of Aram shall go into captivity and to Kurt, saith the Lord. Do you realize all these places are places inside of modern day Syria, not just Damascus, but here's what catches my attention. I will break the bar of Damascus. Okay, that, there's many ways you can take this word in Hebrew and translate it, but it does hold, you can use it as a, as a bar, like, like metal bars. But what does he mean by he'll break the bar of Damascus? You know, what I find interesting Look at verse 4. So I will send a fire in the house of Hazel, and it shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. By the way, Hadad, or Ben-Hadad, being a descendant of Hadad, not directly. When it says Ben-Hadad, I know it means son of Hadad, but it's like grandson of Hadad, uh, or great-grandson great of Hadad, the actual heir or descendant of Esau that went there. Of course, Esau later goes into, uh, into Rome, where we find the Edomites of today. But Ben-Hadad, isn't it interesting that the, the Syrian, and I know this is kind of, I don't mean this as a prophetic thing. I just say it as kind of uh, ironic, you might say. The foreign minister, the, uh, the, the Syrian foreign minister or foreign ambassador to Russia happens to be, his name is Haddad as well. And Haddad, as those that you may know, was the guy that had, was a thorn in the side of Solomon all the days of his reign inside of Syria. And the Haddad that is the ambassador to Russia is also a guy that hates the Jewish people. Uh, so I think that's kind of interesting how it kind of plays out at the same time as this. And I will break the bar of Damascus. Now, let me show you what I believe that this may be referring to. Again, let's take a look over, well, where is it at? Where, there we go, here we go. Air defense system, the S-400 and S-300 system. Why didn't it go off? And as I stated, I kind of think at the beginning of the broadcast here, I believe that the S-300, S-400 system may have been engaged but it just did not do very well. Or maybe they could not keep up with the influx of all those uh, Tomahawk missiles coming in. Now, according to Russian news, Russian experts in the Russian, uh, I must have read maybe a half a dozen of these different articles in the Russian language there, and they were all saying that one of the main flaws of this system here on the Tomahawks is the Tomahawks are running at a low altitude. They go out, they send them out less than 100 uh, meters in the air when they first take off, and they said the distance that they were from uh, Syria in the Mediterranean, and they said taking into account of the curvature of the earth, they couldn't detect it. And that's what made it harder for them to be able to detect it, to try to even engage. But then some of them were making excuses, saying that Russia said they were not there to protect Bashar al-Assad, but their own forces, and that they claimed that they had been moving out their own forces from the base before the strike anyway, because of Supposedly, uh, the United States didn't say to the Russians directly, but they did say to some of the Russian uh, military leaders, and that's how they were able to move some of that out. Who knows what was right? I think Russia did try to engage, but because they only got 26 of the missiles, it was more of a shame to bring this out that they were only 50% accurate. So it's better to say they didn't engage at all than to say that they did. So therefore, now, of course, this strike was not on Damascus. Damascus is coming. The S-300 system is there in Damascus. So could 
This system that looks like bars, and yes, it is a defense system for Syria as well as Damascus, could this be the bar that gets broken, and will it be broken because NATO will use an overwhelming amount of force on Syria? I think there's a good possibility to it. I think it's a plausible explanation for it. So I think perhaps Amos 1.5 could be a prophecy that is speaking about what's going to happen in Syria in the coming weeks and days even. Going into Zephaniah, as I brought to you the other day there, uh, very interesting. You know, I, I got to share something with you too. I thought it was really interesting. Interesting. Jesse on BP Earth Watch here just got a message from him, uh, and hopefully we'll try to get him on. He's been doing some very interesting broadcast about the Antichrist. Now, he's not saying who or whatever, but from what I'm gathering, he's going in a direction that I shared myself with you guys here not too long ago when I first, for the first time, I broke rank from saying the Pope being the Antichrist, which every Pope that's ever been has always been an Antichrist, but shared with you here on Israeli News Live that I believe that the Pope himself will introduce, introduce an alien type of Antichrist. In other words, a fallen angel, a demonic being as being the actual Antichrist, uh, but as some would say, an alien, because I begin to start looking at these things. And of course, from the Apocalypse of Thomas, there clearly seems to indicate that it could be something just of that nature. And I don't know if that's where Jesse's coming from, but he's talking about those fallen angels. Maybe not the ones that in the beginning there, but demons that meet up with, and I don't want to put words in Jesse's mouth there, but anyway, Jesse had brought out something very interesting. He said that tribulation and God's wrath are two different things. I agree with that. I've always believed that. Always taught that as well, especially in light of Zephaniah here in chapter, uh, actually we're in the wrong chapter, it's Zephaniah chapter 2. We find right here uh, in verse 3, Seek ye the Lord, all you humble of the earth that have executed his ordinance, seek righteousness, seek humility, and maybe you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. See, the Lord's anger and tribulation are two different things altogether. Tribulation is just what happens. People go through tribulation, but when God's anger comes down, that's his wrath. That's his judgment coming on this earth, and that's when God hides you is in the day of his wrath. Not man's wrath, not Satan doing his nasty deeds on this earth, but when God's wrath comes on the earth, that's when he hides you away. That's always been my thought. So people say, do you believe in a pre-trib rapture? Well, yeah, in that way there, yes. In God's wrath, a pre-wrath rapture, yes, I do. However you want to translate that, that's up to you. But anyway, right, we drop down to verse 7, as I brought out yesterday to you, and it shall be a portion for the remnant of the house of Judah, where whereon they shall feed in the house, houses of Ashkelon, and uh, Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening of the Lord their God will remember them and turn their captivity away. Uh, uh, it's actually the coast uh, uh, of uh, the remnant of the house of Judah, whereupon they shall feed in the houses of Ashkelon. I know in the King James Bible it speaks about they dwelling on the coastlines there of uh, basically of Israel today. I believe that sets the time frame of what's happening right now because what we're about to see is they're going to force that two-state solution into being. And when they do, the Jews will be living on the, whole, the entire coastline of modern-day Israel, just as it is prophesied here it would be. Let me take you real quick to the King James Version and the way that they word that particular prophecy there because it's very fascinating when you look at it. And the coast shall be for a remnant of the house of Judah. All right, now just showing you that translation and why that is actually that way. All right, it is right there, it's a measuring line, district and in, in, in inheritance. Okay, so that's, where they, that's why they're calling it the coast shall be, because it's a line. In other words, a thin line there of land that Israel will actually inherit. All right, and it'll be for the remnant of the house of Judah, and they shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon, shall they lie down in the evening. Of course, Ashkelon is right there south of Tel Aviv. 
So I clearly see when we're looking at Zephaniah, it clearly seems to be prophesying the events and the time frame that has not been in modern, uh, has never been in the ancient history of Israel. Only in modern days will we see where the Jewish people will only be dwelling on the coast, like it was before 1967. And that's what they're pushing for, is a pre-1967 border. So as much as I love uh uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick and his love and stand for one state, which I would stand for as well. I'm afraid, my brother, what they're going to do is force us out and we're going to find out the world will turn against the Jewish people. Anyway, dropping all the way down, though, let's go down to verse 13. This is what's important. Start with verse 12. Ye Ethiopians also, you shall be slain by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. The thing that I wanted to remind you guys of, the same one that destroys Nineveh, which is the ancient city of Mosul. All right, let's take over here and take a look at Iraq here. There's Mosul up here at the top. All right, now I'm going to show you something about that because see Assyria, by the way, Assyria covered all of modern day Syria here and it went right over there and it covered all that area there. Northwest Iraq, right? Mosul. Okay, look at here. You zoom in on Mosul. Guess what you're going to find here? Nineveh, right in the heart of Mosul. Nineveh, the ruins of Nineveh. ISIS has destroyed that. Nahum prophesied that ISIS, not ISIS, but Nahum prophesied in chapter 2 that they would come in and they would take the silver, the gold, the furniture, and everything and, and, and do what they wanted with it when they first began to fall. What did ISIS do? ISIS went in there, they took the silver, the gold, and all the cash out of the banks and everything else, and all the furniture, and sold it on eBay. Well, what do you know? And then it goes into chapter 3, and we find out that then they become a desolation, Nineveh does. And the people flee and flee and flee. Why? Because why? The United States leading the coalition in Mosul has just devastated this city. And it's said that the same hand that destroys Mosul will destroy Assyria, which is all of modern day Syria, to go, right, to go right along with Mosul. Isn't it interesting how he separated the two? When Mosul was, or Nineveh was actually part of the ancient Assyria empire, but he separated the two in the prophecy. I thought that was very interesting separates the two, separated Nineveh from Assyria. Why? Because God knew that that would be in two different countries and that they would take Nineveh down first and then Assyria second. And they're there now, friends. They are there now, the US, the UK, and the Jordanians getting ready to go and invade into Syria from the south, backing up what Lorenzo found on his uh, own research there about the uh, U.S. military equipment in Beirut, Lebanon. Well, the U.S. generals were there meeting to do exactly that, bring in what they call military aid to help deal with the Syrian problem. Well, it's there. The invasion is about to happen. Russia claims that they're on the verge of a military clash. Russia and Iran warn U.S. that they, uh, they, they, you know, they'll use force if they cross the red line again. Well, Russia, it looks like you're fixing to have to use force. You're fixing to get into a major war, but unfortunately, I don't believe you're going to win this one. It may cause nukes to go off. We may see World War III. And you know, there's so many times, uh, many, many times I, I, we, I look back, I quoted that young man, the Jewish young boy there that had spoke about these things. He said Obama was the Gog and he was going to be the one that caused all this to happen, all this conflict to happen. Then Donald Trump gets in office and people say, well, you know, he was a false prophet, he prophesied wrong, etc., stuff like that. You know what's interesting though? Isn't it interesting that it wasn't Trump that ordered all this equip equipment here to get this war started or to even plan the takedown of Syria? It was President Obama. He's the one that sent desert camo equipment to Germany, to Poland, all of that was pre-planned months in advance. Even Russia said this attack on Syria, the strike on Syria had been planned months in advance under Obama's administration. I think that's kind of interesting. So anyway, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Don't forget, we sure appreciate your support and helping us out. Again, it's right there on the YouTube channel above the subscribe button or visit us at Israeli newslive.org
or in case you never got to go there before, I really need to start riding there. But our news always pops up there too if you'd like to watch our news there. We do write occasionally from time to time. I haven't written anything in a while, but I do need to write some more articles. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Carry on